Lecture 25, Virgil the Magician. Not all heroes have to be warriors, and not all heroes have to be men of great ability in statecraft. Myths are also attracted to poets of outstanding ability, as they are to men of enormous learning in other fields like alchemy and astronomy. To understand how the poet Virgil could come to be a magician, a hero, read about by ordinary people as well as by the nobility, how he could become a far more noble example of magic than Merlin, the magician of the Tales of Arthur, let us go back to the year 1643. And we are in Oxford, that city of beautiful towers and learning, and it's a rainy day, and we are with King Charles and one of his closest advisors, Viscount Falkland. These are not happy days for King Charles. He has done what no government should ever do, outrage his people by raising taxes too high. And Charles has sought to raise taxes without the consent of Parliament, and he now has a full-blown civil war on his hand. The uh, Parliament has risen up. It is raising an army. It will be led ultimately to victory by Oliver Cromwell. And it all comes about as a result of taxes. But at this early stage, for the revolt of Parliament began only the year before in 1642, Charles asked his friend, the Viscount Falkland, how do you think this will all turn out? If only somehow I could look into the future. And Viscount Falkland said, well, we're here in Oxford, place of great learning. There is surely a fine uh, volume of Virgil. Let us do the sortes Virgiliani. Let us take the prophecies of Virgil, or literally the Virgilian lottery. That's what source means, from which we get the plural sortes, a lottery. Let us throw open a volume of Virgil, pick a particular line, and it will tell us what the future will bring. Well, they are led into the best public library in Oxford, of course, it's the king. And Oxford is a royal stronghold. Uh, and a fine volume of Virgil is brought to them, and Charles throws it open, points, his finger is in book four, where Dido curses Aeneas by saying, may he never rule over men again, and may he die violently in a faraway land. Oh, Charles says, this is, you know, really not what I needed to see at this time. Well, Viscount Falkland immediately uh, retraces his steps and says, you can't take any of these seriously. Uh, I'll do it. And he flips it open and comes to the prophecy of Evander. That fair palace, and indeed, Viscount Falkland was a very handsome man with his long curls of a cavalier. Handsome palace, will die violently and long before his time. Oh, well, <laughs> I wouldn't put too much confidence in this. But the next year, at the First Battle of Newbury, Viscount Falkland is killed in battle. And in 1649, his hat upon his head as a sign of disrespect, King Charles sits through his trial and Parliament condemns him to death, and he does die violently at the hand of the axeman. So the Sortes Virgiliani, one of the most enduring proofs of the medieval ideal of Virgil the Magician. We find it expressed in one of its most noble forms in Dante's Divine Comedy. Do you remember the beginning of it? Nel mezzo del cammin di nostra vita mi ritroverà per un silva oscura 
que la vida de Rita era smerita. Dante, at the age of 35, the middle of our journey through life, finds himself on a journey through a dark wood because he has lost the right way. And in this darkness, in this gloom, surrounded by savage beasts, suddenly there appears a figure. Are you a ghost or are you a man? I was once a man. I came from Mantua. I sang of great rulers. I sang of Julius Caesar and Augustus. <gasps> you are, yes, you're my Virgil. You are my teacher. You're my inspiration. Any honor that I have received from my poetry has come entirely from studying you. I have memorized everything you wrote. But why are you here? Do you not wish to learn the secret of salvation? Yes. Yes, I want to learn the secret of salvation. I want to put myself back on the right path. Then I have been sent by God and by your beloved Beatrice. Beatrice, will I see her again? Yes, you will see her again. But first you must follow me down into the inferno. And then I will guide you through purgatory. How is it that a pagan poet who died 19 years before the birth of Christ, how is he the guide to lead Virgil and explain the mysteries not only of the inferno, of hell, but of purgatory? And we learn almost immediately as Virgil comes across the river of death uh, with Dante, and they see almost immediately large castles arising. And one by one, the noble pagans, that is what they are called, are introduced to Dante. Plato, who wrote of the immortality of the soul. Homer, who explained the ways of a just God to mankind. They're all there. All those whose learning, whose philosophy, whose poetry prepared the way in the minds of men for the coming of Christ. And that is what Virgil did supremely. And for the church, Virgil was a proto-Christian, a Christian before Christ had come. Now, in part, this was due to the domination of Virgil over the school curriculum. Once he had written the Aeneid, it was the classic par excellence. It was studied and learned and memorized. Even in the early Christian period, elaborate commentaries were written upon it, giving it an allegorical interpretation. So the men who became bishops in the church, men who became priests, loved and admired the poetry of Virgil and wanted to find a place in the afterlife for him. But above all, what set the seal on Virgil as the preparer of the way for Christ was one of his earlier poems, composed around 39 BC, the fourth eclogue. Before he wrote the Aeneid, Virgil wrote about rustic matters, shepherds, and then about how to farm, but turning all of this into the most elaborate, learned poetry. Now that fourth eclogue became fundamental to the Christian interpretation of the classics. Sicilian muses, let us sing a somewhat loftier strain. Not everyone delights in stories about plants and orchards. And if your song is of the woodland, let the woods be worthy of a consul. And the poem is devoted to one of Virgil's friends and patrons, Gaius Asinius Pollio, consul for the year 40 BC, and a man who had played a very important role in helping Virgil get back the farm of his father. He had lost it in the confiscations following the assassination of Caesar, and Pollio had intervened with Octavian, the man who would become Augustus, to get this farm back for Virgil. 
So the consul is Gaius Asinius Pollio. Now is come the last age of the Cumean song. The great line of the centuries begins anew. Now the virgin returns. The reign of Saturn returns. Now a new generation descends from heaven on high. Only do you, pure Diana, smile on the birth of this child, under whom the iron brood shall at last come to an end. The iron brood, the civil wars, and a golden race spring up throughout the world. Your own Apollo now is king. So this is the last of the old iron age of evil and treachery that has brought civil war upon the Romans. A virgin has come back to earth and a child will be born and God, Apollo, will be king and reign over the earth. And in your consulship, Pollio, yes, in your consulship shall the glorious age begin and the mighty months commence their march. The new golden age will begin. Under your sway, any lingering traces of our guilt shall become old and release the earth from its continued dread. Remember, Rome was founded in fratricide, an original sin. And there were many Romans, like Virgil, who believed that the civil war that had torn Rome, that had led Pompey and Caesar to clash in battle, led Caesar to be assassinated, and then civil war again between Brutus and Cassius, and Mark Anthony and the young Octavian. All of that was expiating this original sin of fratricide. But what is civil war except fratricide? He shall have the gift of divine life. This child shall see heroes mingled with the gods and shall himself be seen by them and shall rule the world to which his father's greatness has brought peace. So this child will grow up to rule the world and for you, child, the earth untilled will pour forth its first pretty gifts, gadding ivy with foxglove everywhere, and the Egyptian bean blended with a laughing briar. Unbidden, the earth will pour forth for you a cradle of smiling flowers. Unbidden, the goats will bring home their udders swollen with milk and the cattle will not fear huge lions, and the serpent too will perish, and perish will the plant that hides its poison, and the spices of the east will spring up on every soil. A new garden of Eden, a new paradise, a Christian would say, all foretold by Virgil. But as soon as you can read of the glories of heroes, and your father's deeds, and know what valor is slowly, will, and know what valor is, then slowly will the plains turn yellow with the waving wheat, and wild brambles will bring forth purple grapes, and the stubborn oak distill dewy honey, a land of milk and honey flowing with all good things. Yet will still, for a while, a few traces of old time sin live on. It will bid men to tempt the sea and ships, girdle towns with walls, and cleave the earth with, fur with furrows. A second Tiphys will arise, and a second Argo, our Jason's Argonauts, to carry chosen heroes. A second war will be fought, and great Achilles be sent again to Troy. Well, in fact, that is what would happen. For Octavian, despite his best will, found himself forced to go to civil war again against Mark Anthony and Cleopatra. He would sail with his heroes and bring victory to Rome at Actium in 31 BC. 
So already seven years before this, Virgil is foreseen on one more great civil war. And again, to the Christian reading this in the first and second century AD, this is a prophet, Avates, like Homer, infused with the spirit of God in his poetry. But next, when the strength of the years has made you a man, even the merchant will quit the sea, nor will the ship of pine exchange wars. Every land will bear all things, earth will not suffer the harrow, nor the vine, the pruning hook. The sturdy plowman, too, will now loose, loose his oxen from the yoke. No more will wool be taught to be put on varied hues. But of himself the ram in the meadows will change his fleece, now to sweetly blushing purple, now to saffron yellow, and scarlet shall clothe the grazing lambs at will. True miracles. Ages so blessed, glide on, cried the fates to their spindles, voicing in unison the fixed will of destiny. The fates themselves know that this is the destiny of Rome. O oh, enter upon your high honors, the hour will soon be here, dear offspring of the gods, mighty son of a Jupiter to be. Your child will be a god like Jupiter. See how the world bows down with its massive dome, earth and expanse of sea and heaven's depth. See how all things rejoice in the age that is at hand. I pray that the twilight of a long life may then be vouchsafed to me, an inspiration enough to sing your deeds. Then shall neither Thracian Orpheus nor Linus vanquish me in song. Though mother give aid to one and father to the other, Calliope to Orpheus, to Linus fair Apollo, even they, if they should have Pan to compose alongside me, even then Pan would be judged himself defeated. So the muse of Pan, the magical Musician Orpheus, begin, baby boy, to recognize your mother with a smile. Ten months have brought your mother long travail. Begin, baby boy, the child who has not won a smile from his parents. No god ever honored with his table, no goddess with her bed. He is born by a virgin. So this is the foreseeing of the coming of Christ. Oh, a classical scholar might try to tell a Christian in the third or fourth century that this was probably a child that was being expected by the wife of Asinius Pollio, or maybe it's just a made-up child. Perhaps it's to reflect a child that was hoped would be born to uh, Caesar Augustus' sister Octavia, married to Mark Anthony at that time. Well, that didn't mean anything to a Christian. The important thing was this was the foreshadowing the prophecy of the birth of the Christ. So Virgil, all through the 4th and 5th and 6th and 7th and 8th centuries, was read and studied. In Western Europe, as the light of learning grew dim, Virgil was still known and reflected upon. And then in 1194, we suddenly find a reference to Virgil, a most curious kind of Virgil, in a, an extremely learned work, the Polycraticus of John of Salisbury, written probably around 1160. He was a churchman, a close friend, in fact, of Thomas Becket. And he wrote the, this work on politics. It's about how kings get their power from God, but also how if a, God abuse, how if a king abuses the power he got from God, then it is just to kill him, tyrannicide. And in the course of these writings, he just mentions a story. It is said that Virgil made a bronze fly according to astrological doctrine, and with that bronze fly kept all the flies out of Naples. 
And suddenly we're introduced into a world of Virgil the magician, far removed from the historical facts that were known about Virgil. And author after author would incorporate stories about Virgil the magician, and they were very popular with the general public. In fact, after printing began, after 1453, there were numerous chapbooks. And a chapbook is a cheap little sort of pulp fiction that was peddled from door to door by a chapman. And these were cheap books, perhaps that's where the word chap comes from, chapman. And you bought these, and we know they were sold to barkeepers and kept there on the bar for people to read. And one of the most popular of these chapbooks were various stories about Virgil the magician, about his miraculous birth, his miraculous education like Merlin and Arthur. His birth, we are told, came about in the following fashion. Both of his parents were from Mantua, and that's true. Both were of the Celtic race. Well, that's possible that they were descended from the Celts who had dwelt in the northern part of Italy, but both were also magicians. His father was a druid. His father's name was Magus, the magician, and his mother's name was Magia, the female magician. But Magus was not the real father of Virgil. No, it was Jupiter himself. He fell in love with Magia and she fell in love with him. Thus, Jupiter took golden flakes and sprinkled them, sprinkled them into her wine cup. And when she saw them, she had to drink the wine. And with delight, drank it down and then knew that she was pregnant. Nine months later, she brought forth young Virgil. And when he came forth, blossoms opened up, though it was winter time, and the whole of the earth all around where he lay became full, filled with flowers. And he immediately, Virgil, began to walk. So a miraculous birth, and we might almost say virgin birth if she gets pregnant from drinking a cup of wine with gold flakes in it. They named him Publius because he was devoted to his country, but also because he had big knees. And Virgilius because he was going to be crowned with the laurel branch, and Mauro because of his swarthy complexion. So Virgil came into the world, and at the age of seven, he was with his uncle, and they were out in the fields, and the uncle said, it is time for you to become educated, for you will be the most learned man of all time. Look, coming out of the west in the sky is a huge black cloud, and it turns into a black bull. And Virgil, this little seven-year-old, turns into a white bull. And they clash together, and Virgil overcomes him. And the uncle says, now you may go out into the world. I want you to study under the poet Lucretius. Now, Lucretius was an Epicurean. I mean, he's a real poet. He wrote on the uh, affairs of nature, uh, a poem in which he presents the view that things happen entirely by chance, and the best thing we can do is to find happiness. And Virgil had much of the Epicurean in him, the desire to have leisure without any troubles. So Virgil goes off to study with Lucretius. None of that ever happened, in fact, and is gone for seven years. And he comes back, a learned young man, and on his way back, he sleeps on the ground with a stone for his pillow. And a dream comes to him, and it says, Virgil, pick up that stone. And he does, in reality, and finds the black book that is the key to all of his knowledge. Virgil begins to carry out deeds of remarkable magic, but also teaching. And one of his first pupils is Asinius Pollio. And Virgil teaches Asinius Pollio the deeper initiation into magic. And Pollio immediately uses, uses it. He goes to visit a senator. And Pollio is in love with the senator's daughter. And the senator's daughter is in love with Pollio. But the senator is distracted. He has promised to show to members of the Senate 
uh, a lion, and he can't find a lion. Well, like that, Pollio creates a lion, and then the senator invites not his friends from the Senate, but his enemy, his various enemies, and the lion leaps up and eats them all. Well, that's the first lesson. And Virgil teaches his pupil to know the knowing gnome of Kenosis. Know the knowing gnome of Kenosis. And a gnome is a spirit of wisdom. And see how we're taken aback to Kenosis, to the place of Daedalus. And one of the most moving uh, portions of Virgil's Aeneid is in fact when he sings of Daedalus and the son who perished by flying too high to the sun. So know the knowing gnome of Kenosis. And one of these gnomes, one of these spirits of wisdom is not to do anything until you read the final word. And Pollio is wise to this. He's out on one of his quests and he's lying behind a rock. And he knows that there is a treasure under that rock. And these two brothers come along and they say, let's lift up this rock and they see this treasure and they have a slave with them. And then they say to each other, the slave gets nothing, we keep it both. Well, Pollio has waited to hear he was going to rejoice with them, but when he hears them say this, to take away what is due the slave, he kills them both and the slave drops through the earth and Pollio drops down with him. And they land in this cave, but they hear noises. And there's a door, and they open the door, and there is Virgil holding a seminar. Welcome, Pollio. Welcome, slave. Partake of our learning. So these very strange stories about Virgil. Then Virgil himself goes on a quest. And he goes to help people. But he wants to help the right people. And for the Christians, this was a sign that he had read Jesus' words. As you have done unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. So he wanders into villages asking for milk. If people give him milk, he blesses their house and they become wealthy. If they refuse to give him milk, all the milk sours. He finds a young girl who has a loom and Virgil turns it into a magical loom that can create the most beautiful of garments. And the girl grows wealthy because she has aided Virgil. Then there are a whole set of tales of Virgil which center around Naples. Now Virgil loved Naples. That is where he built his villa, subsidized by the Emperor Augustus. And that is where he would ultimately be buried. And the story is told, and this is what we have in John of Salisbury in fact, that one of his students was Marcellus, the nephew of Augustus, and Marcellus was governor of uh, Naples. That never really happened, but uh, Marcellus says to uh, Virgil, we've got a terrible plague of flies. Oh, I can make you a bronze fly that will keep away all the flies. And it was true, there were no more flies in Naples. Then Marcellus said, can you help us with our problem of meat spoilage? Oh yes. And he built a meat market that meat could stay in for 500 years and never spoil. But there was another side to Virgil. He was called to Rome. He had built bells, magic bells, in all the towns of the empire that would toll whenever the empire was threatened. And he was brought to Rome, and there the emperor asked him if he could come up with a means of telling whether a woman was adulterous or not. And Virgil created the Bocca della Verita, the mouth of truth. You can still see it in Rome today. And if a woman put her hand in there, challenged by her husband, and she was faithful to him, she pulled it out whole. Otherwise, her fingers were eaten off. So to punish Virgil for this, the women decided to get back at him. They, uh, and there was a woman he was in love with, she was married, and she said, if you'll come up in a basket, you can enter my bedroom, but I want you to come up in the nude. So he started up in the nude, and she stopped the basket, and there he hung all day long in the nude for people to laugh at. Well, then he put out all the fires in Rome, and they could be started again only if from a part of her body 
people drew fire. So Virgil the magician, his bones took on the sanctity of a saint. And it was said that as long as his bones were hidden in the castle that he had built upon a magic egg in Naples, Naples would never be captured. So still today in Naples, they show you the castle of the egg. And still today in Naples, they cherish the bones of Virgil. Virgil the magician, Virgil the forecaster of the coming of Christ.